My name is Julian Willard. And I'm Jim Mack, and this is Pineal Express, where trains of thought intersect. If you like Pineal Express, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pineal express. At various levels of support, our patrons receive extra episodes of the show and other bonus content. In 2009, Binghamton University was embroiled in a scandal that reached national and international attention. The scandal erupted when it came to light that the school had compromised its academic integrity in a zealous pursuit of athletic success for its Division I men's basketball team. For example, school administrators, including some in the athletic department, pressured educators to give basketball teammates preferential treatment, such as ignoring unexcused absences, accepting late assignments, and outright changing of grades. The scandal led to an erosion of Binghamton University's reputation and to the retirement of University President Lois DeFleur. Additionally, in the wake of the scandal, the school neglected to retain the adjunct lecturer who had blown the whistle on administrators' wrongdoing. We asked that whistleblower, Dr. Sally Deer Healy, to talk with us about her experience having shed light on Binghamton University's basketball scandal, being dismissed from her teaching position thereafter, and subsequently having had difficulty finding long-term work in academia. We also talked with Sally about how the scandal is a microcosm for broader systemic issues in academic administration, college sports culture, organizational ethics, group psychology, and especially societal treatment of whistleblowers. Sally is also the executive director of the New York State Conference of the American Association of University Professors, where she hears countless stories of wrongdoing in college administration and how difficult it is for prospective whistleblowers to shed light on the relevant problems there. That makes Sally well-equipped to discuss the broad systemic issues of corruption in academia. So without further delay, welcome Sally Dear Healy to Pineal Express. Well, Sally, thank you for being here with us today. We wanted to start by asking you in very general terms, what is your story as it relates to the Binghamton University basketball incident? Why don't we start from there? Certainly. Thank you. And thank you for having me here today. I had been teaching at Binghamton University since 1998. I was also getting my master's and my PhD there and was teaching the entire time I was there. Everything was fine. Everything was normal. Things were running smoothly. I was teaching. I was grading, turning in grades. New semesters would come by. In the fall of 2008, Mm -hmm. I received an email and a phone call from someone in the athletic department, Ed Scott. And he said that he wanted to talk to me about some of the students that were in my class who were also on the basketball team. And It was a very curious phone call. I really wasn't sure what he was alluding to, but he said, I really want to talk to you about grades and I want to talk to you about requirements of these students and and things like that. And so I basically said, you know, thanks for calling me, uh, you know, have a nice day kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I immediately, like literally walked from my office into Al Deacon's office, who was the acting chair of human development, which is the department that I was teaching at the time. And I said... Al, I don't know what this is about, but I am really uncomfortable with what ha- what just happened. This has never happened to me before, and um, I wanted you to know about it. So I'm I'm documenting that I received this phone call um, and and this exchange, and I don't know what's going to go of it, but I'm I'm letting you know. And, and just he, just so we're clear, uh, just before we go any further, so that we're clear, what what was the nature of the phone call? You mentioned that they wanted to talk to you about some players to, he, on the team. Yeah, he just wanted to be clear what my requirements were for the class and how these students who were also athletes that were in my class were going to be. Um, the expectations for them and how they were going to be graded. Okay. Which was really clearly none of his concern because he's not a professor and what happens in the classroom is the territory of the professor, the teacher, not an athletic coach or someone else working in the athletic department. So you understood this to be a sort of undue interference? I, at that point, I'm not sure if I considered it an interference. What okay. I considered it to be was a setting of precedent, of, of pressure, if you will, that my classes, my grading procedures, um, my requirements for the students were under scrutiny okay. as they applied to students who were also athletes that were in my class. Right. We're like, we're keeping an eye on you kind of a thing. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And and as I said, it felt uncomfortable. It felt unusual. And I felt the need at that point to go straight in and report that to the department chair, L. Deacon, and just said, like I said, I'm not sure what's going to go of this or if anything's going to come of it, but I just want this on record because 
I'm not feeling comfortable with what just transpired. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I forgot about it. I, you know, the semester's on, I'm teaching full time, I'm in graduate school. And I um, got this, you know, just sort of this feeling throughout the semester, he wanted to meet with me, some of the students were not doing well. um, And he wanted to meet with me. And I again, I felt uncomfortable with that, but I agreed to go meet him. And he was making comments like, well, you just don't know who the students really are. You don't, you don't know who the students are. You don't recognize them. It's like, no, I'm very clear. I know who all my students are because I had made known to them that their attendance was horrible. Right. Um, they would, it was a three hour class. And, and might I just mention that the class was mothering feminist perspectives on caring. That was the name of the class. This is significant in the fact that I know for a fact that students were clustered into the human development department and that they were clustered into classes that met rather infrequently. So one day a week class that met for three hours was much easier for someone who had an athletic schedule Mm -hmm. to maintain than it was for a five day a week class or a three day a week class. I do not think that this would have been the first choice of these students is my point, but they were put in my class because it was one that fit with their schedule. It was a three hour class Oftentimes, they would come 15 to 20 minutes late. We did a break at about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. They would disappear at break and not come back for the rest of the class. And so he called me into his office and he said, well, you just don't, you just don't know the students you're talking about. So you have no idea who's really coming and going. And I said, no, I'm really very clear. And I'm also very clear. I know who's signing in, that they're signing in for each other because they're misspelling their names. Oh my goodness. So here we have a group of basketball players on the Binghamton University basketball team. And already your course is structured in such a way that it happens to be accommodating to their schedules. And yet, even though that accommodation is already there for them and anyone else who may take the class, they these students you were noticing still had major problems with attendance, which was part of the requirements for the class to show up. Correct. And they're also fraudulently signing each other in and correct okay Okay. correct but i'm being accused by the athletic department that i don't know who the students are and that i'm confused um and that i should cut these students a break and i said the syllabus is very clear the syllabus applies equally to all students it is a contract between the teacher and the student um i send out my syllabus even before the semester even starts I do have an attendance policy in my classes. Yeah. That is primarily because my classes are very experiential in nature and also because the university has an attendance policy that says, and I quote, students may not miss more than 25% of the classes and still get credit for taking the course. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you were in communication with the director, Al Deacon. He was the acting chair of human development, yes. And so what was the response? Well, so let's back. So so I told him that I had had this meeting with Ed Scott and again said, I am not at all comfortable. I am getting undue pressure to favor some students over other students, to ignore absences, to ignore missed assignments, to ignore all of this. I am not feeling comfortable about this. What What are we going to do? And he said, let me look into it. So he looked into it. And apparently what had happened was there was an email, and I have a copy of this email. It didn't come directly to me, but I was given this email. Um, An email was sent to the head of human development, uh, the dean, sorry, excuse me, the dean of CCPA, College of Community and Public Affairs, Pat Ingram. Uh, An email had been sent that said, it is our understanding, I'm paraphrasing here, but I've almost got the exact words. It is our understanding that there's someone in your department who is not athlete friendly. Take care of it. Mm. Okay. I did not see this email until much later. Al's direction to me was, we hired you. You're an excellent teacher. You have excellent reviews. You're well-loved amongst your students and your colleagues. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll handle this. Don't worry. Just do what you do. So I turned in grades at the end of the semester. And might I also say that we had made undue provisions. I had made undue provisions for group projects to accommodate these students when they were out of town. And in agreement with the other students in the class, had scheduled the presentation that they were supposed to give for part of their class project at a time in the evening when nobody else was going to be around. But we did it just to be able to accommodate two particular students who were also athletes, and they never showed up, even though we had made all the arrangements to fit their schedule, and they never showed up. So they failed that part of the assignment. 
right? And it reflected in their grade. Mm -hmm. So grades are turned in. It's December. Turn all the grades in. This is the fall of 2008. I'm thinking nothing else about it. I'm thinking, Ale's got, you know, Ale is in charge. He says, let it go. Do what you do. Um, I back you 100%. You're set. So I'm not thinking anything about it. Early February of 2009, I get this phone call out of the blue from Pete Thamel from the New York Times. And he said, I got your name from somebody in the athletic department who thought that you would be willing to talk to us about what's going on at Binghamton University and in human development regarding students who are also athletes and grading and things like that and clustering. And I said, I'll talk to you. I need to, you know, check this out first. I said, I'll talk to you. But I want you to know very clearly, if I talk to you, if, if I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I will lose my job. Hmm. And I want that in the article. And it is. And he said he was really very nice. He had been following Brodus since Georgetown. Who, pulling who's Brodus? Coach Brodus, oh, the coach basketball Brodus. coach. Yes, the okay. basketball coach. Um, he had been brought into Binghamton University from Georgetown. At Georgetown, he had been already in trouble for recruiting or at least um, recognized for recruiting out of what we call diploma mills mm-hmm. and and recruiting um, students who were also athletes, very good athletes, mind you, but had horrible academic qualifications. I mean, they were not qualified to be admitted to a university, but because of their athletic qualifications, they were admitted. So he had been following Brodus and he called me and um, I agreed to, I agreed to the interview. Um, Unusually, he ran all the articles by me before they were published. He said he'd never done that before. But I was so careful because I wanted to make sure there are very good people at Binghamton University and there were very, very good students. And some of the students who were also athletes were very, very good students and very conscientious. And I did not want to see them be blamed for or brought into the fray with the ones who were not doing what they were supposed to be doing or the people who were doing things what I would consider to be unethically. So he ran the article by me. The first article, I believe, came out February 9th. Within two weeks of getting that, within two weeks of that article being published, I received the first non-renewal notice I had ever received from the university in 10 years of teaching there. Now, they couched that by saying, well, we sent non-renewal notices to everybody. They're very careful about covering themselves. That's important to recognize. And Um, and that non-renewal notice just means that you're not going to be rehired. That due to they they said fiscal issues. Right now, if you want to look at Binghamton University, it's very clear that there are no fiscal issues there. Um, in they're a very prominent R one university and right, have right. never been in any financial difficulty. But that was the reason for not rehiring me is because of financial issues, and so they couched my non renewal notice by or, or covered it up, I guess you would say, by sending those to everyone else. Everyone else got rehired. I did not. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, you know, the interesting part comes in. So I did. So obviously I went to the union. I were represented by the UUP. And they said that basically the president of the union at that time, um, Jim Dick said, they're afraid. And in a phone call, personal phone call between us, he said, they're afraid to support you. They're afraid for their own jobs. So we're not going to, we, we cannot, we cannot support your case. They who? The, the union? The union. The, yes. My union that yeah. I had paid dues to. Yes. Now, who, how would there have been any authority on the university's part to retaliate against the union itself? It's not retaliating it against the union itself. It's the individuals. Okay. Um, one of the thing that, things that's fairly important to keep in context here is the way that things are done in the way that the university works. Um, HR is there to protect the university. Mm-hmm. It's very clear. It's not there to protect, you know, the people that work there. It's there to protect the university. Yep. The university is out to protect the university. This is all very understandable, yep. right? We, we got that. Um, but what happens is, is when you have, so, so just, I'm, let me fast forward here a second. I'll give you an example. So yeah. the president, Lois DeFleur, sent out an email that said, has anybody been pressured by me, the president, to give undue credit or attention to athletes and to overlook anything? If so, please report it to me within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, first of all, who's going to go back to the president and said, yeah, you pressured me? 
people are not around to be able to respond within 24 hours. So you can see that they set themselves up. And so the response was, well, nobody got back to us and said that they had it. So this doesn't exist. Right. They're playing right. games here. They're yeah. playing games. So I called the union, talked to them. They didn't want to support me. Um, I was contacted by the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors. They had gotten wind. There's a New York State conference, and there um, was not a chapter at Binghamton University, but there are chapters throughout New York State and about four, th- little less than 4,000 members. They contacted me and said, what can we do to help you? Their role, their mission is protecting academic freedom and integrity. Mm-hmm. They invited me to their state conference meeting in Syracuse. It was being held, and I went up there and I talked to them. They wrote a letter on my behalf of support. Um, and then I was advised to get a lawyer. I was a graduate student. I was surviving raising three children on $8,100 a year stipend. Um, there's no way I could have found a lawyer. I couldn't find any local lawyers that would be willing to take me on pro bono mm-hmm. because nobody's going up against the university. And so I contacted lawyers in Albany. I contacted lawyers all over and they all wanted significant retainers that I, as a graduate student and a single mother, was unable to do. So I was left without any kind of legal representation. Fast forward a little bit, the union says, okay, we're going to take your case and we're going to we're going to assign you a labor relations specialist and we'll start hearing your case. So I started meeting with a labor relations specialist. I even went to Albany and had to meet there and present my case before the university representatives there. Mm -hmm. It went through step one, step two, step three. It was ready to go to arbitration. They held it on for about six years. And then they just, I got an email saying they decided to drop it and not go to arbitration after they had strung me along for years, hoping that that was going to be my recourse. What I was asking for, for my case through the union, was my job back, for one. And second, was to be part of or lead a committee that would look into the practices that were taking place and try to help the university take steps to rectify it. That was my, I didn't ask for money. Right. And I think it it is important because you didn't just ask for your own job back, although that is important in and of itself, but you you wanted to be part of a process to make sure this type of thing doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And getting my job back. Now, remember, I was an adjunct. I was a contingent. I wasn't asking for a full-time position, you know, or or anything (laughs) undue. But, you know, they had on numerous circumstances, just too numerous to count circumstances, publicly defamed me. Mm -hmm ruined my reputation as far as I was concerned as a professor that I had worked very, very hard to to not only develop but maintain. And part of having my job back was saying, she's a good professor and we value her work. Right. And what, what and were we, they we saying? made an error, <laughs> you know, in in making these undue judgment calls and creating the situation that we we created. Definitely. And what were they saying that was defamatory? Oh, gosh, let's see. Joel Thier went on public TV. I I remember Joel Thier was one in, uh, I can't remember his exact title at this point. It's been a long time, but he was a, 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 one of the higher ups in the athletic department. Okay. A- athletic administrator. Yeah, yeah athletic, athletic administrator, right. And Joel Thier went on public TV and I still remember, I still remember the day he was on TV. I stood in my living room watching him and he said, she never followed the proper channels. She never told anybody about this. She never went to her superiors. She never did this. She did this. She did that. And I'm like, no, and it's all documented. I mean, and Al Deacon sadly passed away mm-hmm. that fall. That 2009, 2002, he died right in that time frame. I mean, because as he'd been around, he would have clearly, you know, gone back and said, no, she came to me immediately with that first phone call, Mm -hmm. you know, in the fall of 2008. I've been following this all along. I have all of Al's emails. But of course, when he passed away, sadly, you know, all of his his accounts were obliterated and, and there was nothing to follow, nothing to follow up on. So Joel Thier lied on public television. Also, they made it very clear, and I'm kind of, I almost think it was DeFleur that said, well, she participated in a protest um, down at the, the UDC. Um, and, and I didn't. If, I said, if I, prote- if I protested against that, and this is all written up in retired Chief Justice Judith Kaye's 102-page million-dollar report of the university that came about as a result of this investigation, mm-hmm. um, you know, this issue... 
uh, they said that I partic- participated in this protest at the UDC. And I said, well, if I participated in it, then so did the mayor and all the executives from the university because we were standing on the right-hand side, right in front of the podium, where Pat Ingram, the dean of uh, CCPA, was giving her talk, and all the protesters were way, way over in the left and in the parking lot. So if I was protesting with them, then all of them were protesting too. But but they just kept lies a- about things. And and then they, they made comments about, well, she's got an attendance policy. It's like, okay, well, so does the university. Why don't you talk yeah. about hey, My attendance policy follows the university attendance policy. Yeah. But I was being defamed for saying she has an attendance policy. I even went to a meeting. I was on the Center for Excellence. And I went to a meeting, and I remember one of the professors making a very snide comment during that meeting and said, well, I don't have an ego, so I don't have an attendance policy. As if it's about the professor and not about high academics. Yeah. And that, right. that's, that, that is part of what this really cuts down to because – just for context, Binghamton University touts itself as the jewel of the state university system of New York. They take themselves very, very seriously in terms of their academics. And part of the reason, and it's just one small part of a much larger reason why this was such a big scandal, was because it became evident that the university could not claim that it was a powerhouse of academics while at the same time undermining its academic integrity in support of a big popular basketball program. Right. It was it was Lois DeFleur's goal to get to the NCAA before she retired. Yeah. And she and I'm clear as as are others that she sold her soul to be able to do that. She brought Brodus on and said, do what you need to do. Yeah. And that's what he did. I mean, this is very upsetting to me in a number, a number of ways because according to the AAUP, teachers have the right to teach and students have the right to learn. And as far as I'm concerned, the policies that were handled at that point at BU were not conducive to either one of those. Mm-hmm. That not only was I being denied my right to teach all of my students equally, but the students were not giving an opportunity to learn, given an opportunity to learn because they were basically being told that don't worry about it. If you don't cut it in this class, we'll create another athlete friendly class for you with very, you know, simple requirements. And we'll make sure that your GPA is maintained so that you can maintain ac- athletic eligibility. And so when Lois DeFleur reported to the media, all of our, I think it's, all of our athletes are, are maintaining good progress in, towards graduation and, and academic uh, ability. It's like, yeah, of course they are because they're getting these paper classes, which, and I, and I want to be clear here. This is not just Binghamton University. This is indicative of universities. Generally, D1, Division One, two and three don't care nearly as much about this. Mm-hmm. But D1 universities across the U.S. I mean, it happened at Rutgers. It happened to UNC. It happened at Chicago. It happened, I mean, it happens everywhere. And I also want to be clear. Just because it's normalized, it's not normal. Right. There's a difference between normalized and, and normal. I mean, my, I have a, you know, book chapter published on this where I, you know, I go through and, and I, I cite numerous cases where a student who is also an athlete, and that's an important term to, to not say student athlete. And I want to just make that clear. Saying a student who is also an athlete recognizes that we have students who are also mothers, students who are fathers, students who are full-time workers, students who are in the art department or another department or take another club or, or activity at the school. We don't say student actors, student tech people. We don't say that. We only say student athletes. So it's very clear. The Drake Group, which is an organization that I am involved with now, who also came to my aid um, during this, their goal, their mission is academic integrity amongst mm-hmm. collegiate athletics. They are very, very clear that um, these, you know, these are issues indicative of many universities and institutions. Sure. Um, so systemic I just, problem. Right. It, it's a systemic problem. Absolutely. The curiosity about BU is like, we're not up there. You know, we were never up there or nor were we ever going to be up there in terms of the Big Ten. Right. We're, we're not one of those schools. We're not the Syracuse Orangemen, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we don't, so it's different. And even at Syracuse, it's not an excuse. But this, this one, if I can go back to the, the book about, you know, students who would take 72 credits in a summer so that they could get all these classes and, and then examples of tests that some of them took, like how many baskets are on a basketball court? <laughs> You laugh. Pretty ridiculous. This yeah. is serious, though. This is, this is, is the this kind is of, this is real. These are the kinds of questions that they were asked. Oh, A, 
got the right answer. Yeah. You know, so people were going overboard. And if I could just come back to the denying the students the right to learn piece, if you're told that, you know, no matter what you do, you're still going to pass, what they're basically telling them is you're too stupid for us to spend our time trying to actually teach you. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I said, your education has failed you. I have, I still have a piece of paper at home that I keep in a notebook of a student from Syracuse University who wrote a paper that I am 100% convinced my daughter, granddaughter in kindergarten could have written better. Horrible. Their, their educations have failed many of these young men. More times than not, they're men of color, you know, African American, black men, whichever term you, you choose, coming from, you know, situations where they did not have the best of educational opportunities through no fault of their own. Right. No fault of their own. And they, they, their idea of their claim to fame or their ability to be, be able to make it to the university is through their ability in athletics. And, I, and there's value in that. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there is value in that, but you can't forget the academic part of it. Because what a lot of my other students complained about is, wait a minute, they don't get to come to class. They don't, you know, they don't have to do the work. They get the degree. They get out into the workforce. They're going for a job and somebody says, oh, you're from Binghamton University. Here's, and they find out there's absolutely no substance to their education. And then they said it cheapens our education. Right. And I felt the same way because my master's and my PhD were coming from there as well. I also have a degree from Binghamton University. And and so uh, I have similar thoughts about that. And I, and I think a key point that you're making, Sally, and I'm really glad that you're making this point, is that you know it would be bad enough if this was an impingement on your rights as an educator and an impingement on all the other students' rights as as fellow students and colleagues of these players. But it also hurts the players themselves. Absolutely. They're not going to be basketball players forever, right? There is something valuable about these players having a right to high expectations in education so that they can have the opportunity to reach their full potential in education rather than administrators saying, well, you know, you're good at shooting hoops. And so we're not going to invest in you as much to give you that positive educational outcome that you can then fall back on when you no longer are an athlete. Or you get injured. Yeah. At, at which point, you know, most of them would lose their their athletic scholarships if they came on. And that's the other thing at D1 schools. They don't offer athletic scholarships at the lower levels. So it's the D1 school that would offer an athletic scholarship. They get hurt. They're done. Then what do they have? So, I mean, it is an extremely important point. And, and I remember going up to three of these students after the, the semester was over and a lot of this had happened. And, and um, I, I said to them, I said, I'm really sorry you know, that all this happened. They said, you're a great teacher. This, none of this was your fault. We're sorry too, you know, that all of this happened. I mean, they were, they were well aware. Um, and so, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's a massive, it's a massive travesty. As it turns out, I was brought back, um, and allowed to teach in that department. I get, was given a class. Um, and, uh, and then I was told I wasn't rehired again. And then, um, the chancellor, Nancy Zimfer went on, television and the radio saying that, um, you know, talking about the situation and said I had a job. What people don't realize until the investigation was over. I, I They were going to hold on to me until, um, because they brought in, as I said, retired Chief Justice Judith Kay mm-hmm. to do a million dollar investigation of the university. And so they said until that, that investigation was finished, they would leave me, give me one, one class um, to teach at the university. What they didn't make clear was that literally, and I'm not kidding you, five minutes, no more, before they went on air, I got an email from the provost without even a signature block. I'm, I mean, we're talking like it might be a text message, you know, kind of thing that said, um, during the investigation, you'll have a job and then sign the provost, you know, the name. There was it, no signature block, no formal anything, just that. And basically what they did was they covered their butts yeah. just before they went on television to say I have a job because five minutes before that, I did not have a job. To make it look better because they were concerned that the investigation would show that you had been retaliated against as a whistleblower. Absolutely. And, and did the investigation show that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, still, I am not back at Binghamton University. 
um, and, and was never invited back to teach. And, and it was made very clear that I was, I was not welcome there. It became an extremely hostile work environment in the human development department. People who used to be extremely friendly to me would walk by me in the hallway and look the other way, total cold shoulder, no communication. Um, Leo Wilton was made the chair of the department. Um, and, you know, they wanted me to go in and meet with him. And I said, I'm not going in without a union rep, not because he was part of the issue. Um, and I said, I'm not going in. And so then no meetings were ever held. So it was made very clear that, and then that last semester, I was actually put in another department. I was not even in human development, which was the department that not only I had taught in for 10 years, but I had created classes for, yeah. for the university. One of which my divorce culture class got both national and international notoriety and was written up in a number of publications, brought good publicity to the department. And I had been asked to recreate and improve their, one of their core research classes. Uh, that was a required class for it. So obviously I was a well-respected, even though I was only an adjunct, um, I was a respected member of the department. And, and then suddenly I was just, I was disposable because I had brought up, I had, I had aired the dirty laundry, mm-hmm. so to speak. And I think what I, I realized, I, I know administrators there. I mean, I still have friends over there. It's very, very uncomfortable for me to be on campus. Even today, even with all of the students that were involved there, long, long gone, Um, I, although that's my alma mater and I spent a good portion of many years at that university, I'm extremely uncomfortable going on campus. It, it just does not feel safe. I got a death threat when I was there. Someone pulled up to me in the parking lot, put a gun motion with their hand to their head, pulled the trigger, pulled, put their window back up and drove away. That's, that's documented in a, um, university police report. I'm so sorry that happened. So I felt very unsafe there. I had people say to me, aren't you afraid to be out in public? Mm -hmm. Aren't you afraid that somebody's going to get you? Don't you know how important the basketball team is to this community? I think I had told you once, Jim, that I was at a a labor parade on St. Patrick's Day participating with a union and um, had somebody come up to me and say, do you really feel safe being here? Aren't you worried about being out in public like this? Mm -hmm. And I'm a pretty, I'm a very strong person. I'm the one that would always walk my students to their their places at night or their cars at night in the parking lot and then walk back to the building or walk back to my car. I'm I'm not a person that frightens easily. And I remember walking down the street at that one particular St. Patrick's Day parade and saying to my husband, we have to go. We have to go. I'm really, I'm, I'm spooked. You know, we have to go. And we walked out of the parade and we went home. And I've not been back to that parade since. So this has been very significant in my life um, in terms of, you know, my my picture was on the Press and Sun Bulletin website page for months. My daughter said, can't you get that off of there, Mom? Because, like, my friends are calling me. Mm -hmm. And it impacted my family. Um, I refer to this as, as probably, and, and in talking to others who have undergone similar circumstances, they have echoed this, a very dark time. Didn't want to answer emails, didn't want to go out of the house, didn't want to go to the grocery store because I couldn't go anywhere, literally anywhere, the hairdressers, anywhere, without people coming up into me and saying, aren't you the person who, you know, blew in the, the basketball team and aren't you, you know, how, how could you do that? Don't you understand how important sports are? And I was accosted, literally, everywhere that I went, and it became very uncomfortable to go anywhere. Yeah, that's really tough. It it goes to show that there are both administrative and social consequences for whistleblowers. And you mentioned that you've talked to other people that have done similar whistleblowing activity. Some of which have, by the way, committed suicide, some of which Mm. have had suicide attempts, many of which who have died very young due to stress-related complications. Mm -hmm. And that's all documented. Yeah. So what does this tell you then about institutions generally? Because Binghamton University is a microcosm of a much larger academic system and a much larger culture of institutions, whether they be the Catholic Church, whether they be government, whether they be academia, where there seems to be, and I know that you've done some work into this, there seems to be a kind of circle the wagons mentality in institutions and administrations to kind of protect their own and protect their secrets and retaliate against whistleblowers uh, as part of that. So what has this experience taught you about just how institutions work to cover their own asses? It's funny. I'm a sociologist and I, I study family, family health 
and family violence. So organizational culture was not high other than looking maybe at the medical system, Mm. um, was not very high on my list. As a result of my experience at Binghamton University, I amassed quite a library of books on organizational culture and started Mm. looking into that because I just found the whole idea of... uh, I was aghast. The more I learned about what was going on at, at Binghamton University, the the more I realized how widespread and how deep the corruption was. And and I would absolutely call it corruption. In terms of organizational culture, what I've what I've discovered is you're accepted in the organization as long as you don't go against the organization or the institution. The minute you bring up any mention of any shortcomings, of any behavior that might have been questionable or or tactics that might have been questionable, you become an immediate pariah. Mm -hmm. And that is very well articulated throughout the university. I mean, everybody finds out about it. It's a small, it's a big school. It's a small community in terms of word travels, you know, word travels fast. I have one um, friend in the administration I remember saying to them, and I'm, I'm very careful. If you'll notice, I'll say them, not he, she, or because people are scared and rightfully so. Based on what happened to me, I understand why people truly understand why people don't speak out the, against the institution or any other institution for that matter, which their livelihood and their family's well-being and, and health and well-being and welfare rely on. Mm-hmm. Um and I and I said they said it was it was financial, and their response was financial. That's crap. Basically, they wanted to get rid of you because you were bringing up things that they didn't want public. Yep. And they were determined that they were going to get rid of you no matter what that took to do. And that's somebody coming from high administration that would not go on public record forever saying that, because it's their job too. What stuck out to me from what you were saying is how somebody could go on, you know, let's say, um, you, you, you know, you were talking about uh, the way in which people would say defamatory things against you. And then the kind of culture, uh, like you said, word travels pretty fast, but people listen to that and then turn against you. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like whether it be the cultural attitude towards whistleblowers or just the cultural attitudes towards athletics in general – it stuck out to me that how how quickly your your name can be defamed, mm-hmm. and and I'm I'm convinced that this has been an issue. Now I was a returning student. I'll I'll give it that right. I was not your typical you know twenty or thirty year old graduate student, um, but still I had a very promising. I believed a very promising career ahead of me. Um, I did very well in, in in graduate school, and I've not ever been able to secure a full-time tenure track position. Now I know that they're fewer and far between than they have been in the past. I'm very well aware of the, you know, the, the uh, dynamics right now in, in academia in terms of the switch from tenure track positions to, to adjunct or contingent positions. But still I'm convinced that the reputation that has come, you know, has followed me of being someone who speaks up and speaks out and, and everybody's got closet or skeletons in their closet. And they're not going to hire somebody who may discover those skeletons and, and make those known. Um, there was another incident in another university that I taught it as an, as an adjunct. And in, in a nutshell, my application for a full-time position, which I had an excellent chance of getting, I, I should have gotten an interview because I was told that, um, by, by the people in the department. But my, my application was actually sabotaged so that, I didn't get even a phone interview. And even the chair of the department came to me and said, I have no idea, you know, how this happened because you should have at least had a phone interview because you've been teaching here successfully. And, you know, again, great student reviews and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, The suggestion I had been told by several people in the department, you would not believe what they did was the term that I got, that, that was how it had come to me. You would not believe what they did. You need to go to HR I went to HR, same thing happened. So I'm advised by people in the department to go to HR. I go to HR, and then the same thing happens at that university. So I've clearly had the experience um, at, at more than one place is if you want your job, you, you, you're you quiet, you, you go with the flow. You If you see something wrong, you ignore it, and you certainly don't bring it up to anybody where, where it could go public because universities are 
all about damage control. Mm -hmm. And they're all about, all institutions are like this. Yeah. They're all about damage control and they're all about protecting the reputation of, of the institution at the, at the expense of the people who, who work for them. Some of which have worked for a very, very long time. And like you mentioned, uh, just the contrast between Brodus, right? The, the uh, recruiter, he apparently had a reputation himself, uh, like you said, for, for recruiting from these diploma mills, but he was protected by the institution. Correct. So, Correct. You know. Because that was their, their, that was their hire of him. Um, since all of this has happened, I became the president. I was elected the president of the New York State Conference of the American Association of University Professors and now serve as their executive director. I resigned as the president and, and took on the, the job of the executive director. And in my position as both president and as executive director, I get stories. I have people calling me or emailing me all the time about these things that happen across New York State. And because I also sit as an elected delegate to national AAUP, I get it from the national perspective as well. But do you know what it feels like to get a phone call from a almost 70-year-old person who has spent 30 plus years of their life giving to the institution, getting wonderful reviews and, and accolades and awards by the institution, who finds that there's something going on that's unethical, brings it up, and then their life becomes a living hell. They're so stressed and so it, it, it's such an issue that they're significant. They're, they're suffering significant mental, um, emotional and physical health problems. And it's so bad. I had one gentleman who called me and said, I can't even tell my wife what's going on. I can't even tell her I'm up all night long. I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm. This is a stable, you know, well-respected professor and the university is just terrorizing him, utterly terrorizing him. And I hear stories like this on an extremely regular basis. When universities terrorize their whistleblowers, what are some of the other ways in which these whistleblowers have pointed to wrongdoing in their university that they're now getting retaliated against for? Uh, it's a, you know, that's a really good question, but it's so broad. I mean, it could be simply something as, as um, unsafe, something unsafe on campus that they brought attention to. Mm. Uh, uh, a, a lighting's lighting being out. Um, I, I'll give you another example. Again, my example. Um, I was on the committee, the safety committee, campus safety committee. I'd been asked to be, participate on that. So I did. And so we would take regular walks around the university at different hours of the day and look for things that might be troublesome, problematic to students against their safety. Right? So I'm on this committee. I'm at the UDC, brand new building, lovely building. And the back door, the, the riverside door was massively heavy. And I had students who, who also had disabilities. And they had come to me in class and said that they had been hurt mm. by trying to get in this door. And so I went down and I had also realized that my husband's in construction. He also, I said, will you come and you feel this door? Because you build buildings. You, you put in doors like this. Tell me if this door is okay. And he agreed that the door was pretty heavy um, and difficult to open. So I reported the door. And said, is there something we can do about this so students aren't getting hurt? You know, and they can open the door more easily. And I was told, well, just use the, just use the, the handicapped entrance button, right? That that was their answer to using handicap. Well, I went further because I'm a research person. I went further. I ended up calling the city codes people and the state codes people. And it turns out that the university is not held to the same code standards oh, wow. as other buildings in the city. So there was nothing anything could be done about it. Oh. I got it, I got invited to be removed from the committee, hmm. even though that was part of my my role on, on the committee. So the, you know, there's people who, um, you know, it might be they might have spoken out against something that's been happening or something that's been going on at the university, a safety issue, a, a, a grading issue. It could, I mean, I've just seen a variety of things. It, it there is no one thing. Do you get stories of sexual harassment? Oh yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I figured, yes. you know, in, in the Me Too era, you, you certainly expect that faculty in universities might be propelled to report more, whether they're victims of sexual harassment or whether they see it happening. There is a greater culture of reporting, but then these people become whistleblowers and potentially could get retaliated against. Right. 
Right. Nobody likes to have their dirty laundry or aired. Mm. I know that that's been, you know, an issue at campuses everywhere as well. You know, they don't, they have to report the number of assaults, but it's how they're actually treating the people. Um, at one school, I'll be very careful here. At one school, I am aware of a student being stalked and sexually harassed by a um, security guard mm. on campus. That report did not go well. And they were, you know, invited not to pursue that because this person was a well-respected security guard on campus and had been there forever and, you know, some nepotism often going on. And, you know, so, you know, here's this student, like, I don't feel safe. And this security guard is actually the one in charge of my dorm. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that even with students, you know, um, and professors and, and, you know, and I think what I also want to make clear is people with tenure, that was one of the comments that was made to me too many times to count is, and you did this without any protection of tenure. I can't even tell you how many emails and, and, and calls and, and people who had said, you did this without the protection of tenure. I'm an adjunct. I'm a continued. I'm higher and fire at will. Mm-hmm. I mean, they make it brutal for people who are tenured and have been at universities for years. I'm totally disposable. An adjunct or a contingent, they don't dare speak out. They don't have offices. They don't have computers. They have no official place to meet their students. They get paid abysmal wages. Yep. But don't let them ever speak out against any of that because guess what? The next semester, they find out that they're not rehired. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've got a cadre of desperate recent grad students that are willing to take your job for those Absolutely. for those low wages. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is that neck down mentality. Just do what we tell you to do and don't think, yeah. you know, don't bring up anything. I was approached at the elevator by an individual in CCPA that was on tenure track, was not yet tenured. And they approached me at the elevator and they said, oh, I heard what happened about them asking you to change a grade. Because that's how this all came about. I was told that it was being my best interest if I changed the grade. Yeah, directly. Yeah. And um, and I said, what do you mean? And, and she said, well, the same thing happened to me. They asked me to change a grade too. And I said, well, what did you do? And she said, well, I changed the grade. We can see why somebody would do that. There's a lot of pressure I on this. I thoroughly understand it. Yeah. I thoroughly understand it. I was asked not too long ago, if you had this to do all over again, would you do it again? And I said, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. My integrity does not allow me to do anything, anything less than that. Right. And, and unfortunately, um, people are punished for their integrity in, in not only in academia, but elsewhere as well. Yeah. And, and, and looking at elsewhere, you know, there's so much of what you said in your story that I think is reflected in other whistleblower stories, like in, including Edward Snowden, for instance, who they, what did they say about him? Why didn't you go through the proper channels? Well, of course he didn't go through the proper channels because the proper channels reporting to his superiors or even reporting to Congress, uh, those channels are, yeah, those channels. The channels are corrupted. (laughs) And they're there to protect the corrupt institutions. So of course you don't go through the proper channels. Going through the proper channels is how people get stymied. Right. And people have had their fam they've been threatened. Their families have been threatened. I, I attended when I was teaching at Cortland. I went up to Syracuse for the whistleblowers, that national whistleblowers tour. I have to tell you, that was one of the most difficult. It was also a difficult experience. And I just sat there and, you know, it makes me, maybe it makes me sound weak. I don't know. It makes me empathetic as far as I'm concerned. But I mean, tears were just streaming Mm. down my face. I felt such a a sense of, oh, my God, I totally get. (laughs) and, And, you know. The, the the fact that they talked about it that it had on on their again their emotional and physical well being and their families and the, the you know just the, the the larger picture of all of this just because they told the truth and and this is the part that boggles my mind why are we punishing truth tellers and the people who are trying to make things better again my recourse with the university is bring me back. Let's figure out how to do this in a more ethical way that that both supports the teacher's right to teach and the student's right to learn. Hmm. I did not think that that was an unusual or maybe it was unusual, but I (laughs) I didn't think it was, you know, some unbelievable expectation. I wanted to make things better. It it sounds like you're expecting institutions to live up to their own standards, their own PR about who they are as institutions. Right. 
And I've said this at a lot of, I know, AAUP meetings. It's like, wow, I expected better out of people in academia. Mm-hmm. We're teaching the next generations. And people just look at me and shake their head and said, you have no idea. Mm-hmm. You know? And and again, I, I really want to make clear, there are wonderful people in the administration. Yep. There are wonderful people, professors, adjunct and tenure and tenure track. There are wonderful people in the athletic department. I had no issues when I was teaching at Syracuse University, none whatsoever. Beheim would call me. How, 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 are, how are they doing? They're okay. They're all right. Keep me posted. You do whatever. You do whatever you need to do in your classroom. You are the teacher. Wow, that's what directly Behan. from Jim Behan. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, he was awesome, and and other other professors. I had a student also at, at BU um, who was an athlete, and I it was a previous basketball coach, and the student did not do well in my class, and the coach came back to me a couple years later and said, "I just wanted to say that I really honor what you did, and if somebody had done that with him a long time ago." Maybe he wouldn't be in the position that he's in, mm. you know. So these were I got I've got received support from from coaches and from people in the athletic department who realize it's an issue, um, and who really do care about these young. And it's and the other thing is it's a very gendered issue. Not only is it a, 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 a ethnic racial issue, but it, it it's also very much a gendered issue because I can tell you honestly, I have never ever heard of any of this going on with female athletes. Yeah, ever. And very, very few with with white or Caucasian athletes. Mm-hmm. And again, I think that I'm a sociologist. I mean, I'm you know I teach diversity and social justice. This tells me that this is a social justice issue. Right. You know, we have errors um, and inconsistencies and and huge gaps in our education system that do not allow for the the proper education of all members of society. It also goes to show, I mean, there's just so much money in college basketball mm-hmm. in the NCAA. There's so much money. You can almost see how some of these people that sacrifice, you know, their integrity or their values can be uh, pulled into the gravity of that much money. Absolutely. I remember asking a class of my students at Syracuse University, so what's more important at Syracuse University, athletics or academics? And I mean, it was it was astounding. They were like, well, athletics. I mean, they were, they were incredulous that I could even ask the question of, well, athletics, absolutely, the Orangemen, right? And I said, then why don't we call it Syracuse Athletic Academy instead of Syracuse University? Mm-hmm. And they kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? And it's like, this is an educational institution. And so the question comes up is, should we even have students who are also athletes taking classes at the same time that they're involved in, in athletics? Mm-hmm. Should they be paid? They're being exploited right and left. Absolutely. I mean, unbelievable, especially the at the higher, they're not the ones getting rich. And, you know, they, again, they come out with injuries or they don't make, I mean, they're all stuck. Think about it. You're a young boy or a man in a compromised, you know, low income neighborhood and you get, you're a good ball player, right? And I want to be clear. I love sports. I met my husband playing soccer. Okay. You get recruited. Somebody sees you and they watch you play ball and they say, we believe you have a future. We believe that you could make it to the NCAA. What young man or his family is going to say, nah, we're going to pass up on this college scholarship. You know, we're going to pass up on this opportunity because they feed them with this idea, including providing prostitutes. And I'm not saying that happened to Bingham Union University, but I know that it does happen. Providing prostitutes for players. You come here. This is what we'll give you. These are your incentives, right? Um, all sorts of improprieties have been done in terms of providing students who are also athletes with uh, perks above and beyond what your normal average student, you know, would, would get. And, you know, we're exploiting them. We're absolutely exploiting them. And of course, their families are going to say yes, you know, and, and, and they want to support, they want to see their, their children succeed. But unfortunately, it doesn't play out that way. Mm-hmm. How many people actually go pro coming out of universities, especially the percentage of the people who play to the people who go pro, especially when you're talking about a place like Binghamton University? Mm-hmm. You know, people talk about the the racism of low expectations. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you're speaking to about these athletes who are predominantly African American and who are helping to promote the university because the the university touts its sports program and gets all the energy and all the money that comes with that and all the all the promotion 
And and yeah, it's those players themselves that are not getting rich unless it's those very few that end up going pro, which like you said, is not happening at Binghamton University anyway. Um, and, and who additionally lose out on the, the benefit of an education because people don't expect them because of their own stereotypes and prejudices to be able to uh, perform at at the high level that you required of all your students. Mm-hmm. And and it's and, it, and you also mentioned that it's just men, right? It's not the women's basketball team wasn't getting uh, specific favoritism or being asked faculty to change their grades and make them artificially inflated. <laughs> Um, and neither was the cheerleading squad, right? Neither was any women's sports cheerleading, any any of the particular... Or any of the non-money-making sports. I think that's right. an important thing, too. We're not talking about the swim team or the wrestling team or anything like that. We're talking about the the the, the Bearcats, right? The, yeah. it, it'd be, you know, the, the people who brought in the money, the games, the, you know, the hype, um, uh, all of that. So you're right. I, I mean, that's a, that's a huge... It's a huge issue. And it's it's such a... As an educator, it's such a travesty. Yeah. I remember in my undergraduate um, years at, at Potsdam reading a book called Ain't No Making It, Aspirations and Attainment in a Low-Income Neighborhood. I think I've got that um, pretty close on title. And it talked about these two groups of students, young people who had grown up basically in the hood, right? I, I mean, very low-income neighborhoods and everything. And the difference between them was that one of the groups, the parents said, you can be whatever you want to be. Just because this is where you are now, you can be. We'll support you. We're there for you. You're you're capable. You know, you can do this. And then the other group was, um, you know, really, this is your lot in life. I mean, you know, it's been generational. Um, You're never going to get out of here no matter what you do. It's never going to be valued or you're never going to go anywhere. So you might as well just resign yourself to that. And so this this researcher followed these two groups and found that the ones who had been supported and, and given the resources that they needed did extremely well. They, they succeeded. They moved up. They, they made something of themselves. And the ones that were not supported and were basically said, we don't believe in you. We don't think you're worth the time. You know, no, the things are never going to change. Continued that generational pattern of poverty and, and low income and all of this. So it was, I remember that book really clearly. And, and I think that that's exactly what we're talking about in, in some of these instances that, you know, again, these, these guys play a mean game of ball. You know, they're good. I mean, you got to have some respect for the fact that they've spent a lot of their time shooting hoops, mm-hmm. you know, in, in some lot somewhere or some some uh, community center that's been put together wonderfully, you know, with somebody's expectation of giving these kids a place off the street so that they could hone these skills. And there's a lot to be said for athletics, uh, the camaraderie, the teammanship, you know, uh, there's a lot of good things ab- about um, athletics that could easily be transferred over into the educational setting. Right. Um, and I, one of the other things I just wanted to mention is I, I had several sets of parents approach me um, who said their sons wanted to play basketball at Binghamton University, uh, but they wanted to major in chemistry or biology. And they were told that they were told they couldn't do those majors, that they had to major in human development. Do not tell me clustering was not taking place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is that is kind of the thing. There is a a reputation that uh, the student athletes will go for the the quote unquote easy majors. And it's evident that part of the role of faculty is to not allow their courses to be quote unquote easy majors. If they take their teaching seriously and their course of study seriously, as you did, then you, you expect a high level of performance. My reputation in the department was tough but fair. Yeah. It was a very rigorous. I, they, you know, they're paying for an education. They should get an education. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was, you know, and I had A, there are A students, there are B students, there are C students. If they're all doing their best and doing the work and showing up, they, they have something to be proud of. Right. Um, they, if they have something to say for the, even if you're a C student and you worked your butt off to get that C, there is honor in that as opposed to somebody who gets a grade given to them versus a grade that they earned. Mm -hmm. So what policy proposals have you come up with as potential solutions to mitigate the problem of whistleblower retaliation in institutions, especially in academia? Well, there have to be policies and procedures in place. And they have to be consistent and they have to be followed and monitored. 
there has to be follow-up. There has to be protection. There are right now very few, if any, whistleblower protections. And and even if there are whistleblower protections, people are afraid to come forward Mm. because they're not honored. This reminds me a little bit of some research I did about family leave policies in Denmark and Norway, where they have very liberal family leave policies, um, a year of paid leave for both mother and father, and even if it's an adoption and, you know, wonderful policies, but still people don't take them, take full advantage of them because they're afraid that it will compromise their job when they go back. So even though that these are government, you know, allotted policies and, and supported, people are still not taking advantage of it. Why? Because that they know that there's retaliation. My goodness, if you really took your job seriously, do you think you'd take a year off to spend with your mm. baby? You clearly can't be as serious about your job as someone who only took the eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a tricky thing with institutions because here you have official policies on the books, but the institutions are comprised of people and people have these social relationships and social attitudes toward each other and factionalism and cliques and right. are you a team player or not a team player? Right. Well, if you, when you have the head of the registration department being the best friend of the president of the university and that the president of the university has made it clear that, that she wants to go to the NCAA and we need to recruit athletes to be able to accomplish that goal, one can understand how the boundaries get blurred. This is, you know, this is just occurring to me now, but I've seen some data that public faith in institutions across the board are at an all time low, whether you're talking about Congress, whether you're talking about academic institutions, there's just very, very low public faith in institutions generally. And so I wonder, you know, what changed? Because these, the way that institutions work and this kind of circling of the wagons and persecution of whistleblowers, that there's nothing new about that. And so I wonder what it is now. Do you have any sense as you kind of navigate this space since, you know, since your time at Binghamton University, do you have any sense of what changed in institutions to make them more corrupt and more obviously corrupt in the, in the eyes of people? I think that the current political climate and the changes in the current political climate have woken people up. Um, to a new sense of activism, a new sense of ethics, a, a new sense of requiring accountability for time, for tax dollars, for, uh, you know, performance of services and, and things like that, that maybe there was more of a blind acceptance of before and a blind trust of before. I participated in the Women's March in Washington, D.C. Yeah, we went we really down on together. the bus. Yes, we went down together. Yeah, send me those pics if you, uh, if you remember. Oh, I have, I, I, I have <laughs> tons of them. Yeah, that was a great, that was a great experience. But I think, you know, as, as overall, what a wonderful experience that was. One of the things that is most memorable from that trip, aside from being on the bus at 3.30 in the morning, mm-hmm. is a young woman that I ran into down there who was marching next to me. And she said, I'm so glad that Trump got elected as president of the U.S. And I looked at her and I kind of, you know, gave her this questioning look. And she said, because if he hadn't, I would have never been spurred to political consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is part of what we're talking about. I think, you know, we hear more about when I was young and growing up, you didn't hear about wars or, um, you know, this firsthand accounts of wars or weather disasters and any of that stuff because of this new uh, awareness, the, the tweets and, and email and Facebook and all of these things, I think people are becoming more aware and there is less blind acceptance. Mm. Not by everybody. There is still the, you know, the sheeple, as sure. we refer to them in sociology, but, you know, but there are people who are now saying, I want to know more. You know, I want some accountability. I want it. I want the facts and I want the truth as opposed to not getting that. Mm. So I, I think that there is a, an, a, an awakening. I think it's taking place in academia. I think it's taking place in politics. I think it's taking place in healthcare, which is an area of my research. More and more people are starting to question traditional procedures and ways of being even within the medical field and starting to look at options and opportunities hmm. for change. Yeah, it seems uh, it seems to me too that as wealth inequality is exacerbated, it seems like a through line of whether you're talking about students whether you're talking about low-income athletes, whether you're talking about grad students, across the board, it seems like a a through line is this leveraging. You can leverage people into silence, into turning a blind eye, and especially if jobs aren't as secure as maybe they used to be, 
it can exacerbate some of this uh, institutional degradation. Oh, absolutely. Fear is a powerful motivator. Fear is also a powerful inhibitor. And people are today, rightly so, at least and especially in academia, are afraid for their jobs. Tenure track is just going by the wayside. Those positions are not being... We've gone from about 70% tenure, 30% adjunct, to 70% adjunct, 30% tenure, and falling. So you are seeing a, a, a substantial decrease. And what tenure meant for a lot of people, what tenure meant was safety. It meant job protection. There isn't that anymore. You know, contingent faculty often find out a week or two before the class starts that they're going to have a class. How do you order books? How do you prepare a syllabus? How do you do that if you only find out a week or so before that you're going to have a class? Or conversely, that you planned on having a class and you find out the week before that you don't, which then leaves you in a, in a position where you cannot find another position because they've all been filled. So people are willing to basically do whatever they need to do because they have bills to pay, families to feed, they need jobs. So you see a compromise of, of values in that. All right. Well, Sally, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your whistleblowing. Thank you for talking to us about a very important issue that is so systemic and that goes across institutions, especially in academia. And uh, I think it's really important that we shed light on this. So thank you for continuing to shed light on such an important problem. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm honored to be here. And, and thank you for listening. Um, I do have a, a book. I want to do my, my bit promotion here it. if yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, I have a book contract. Finally, 10 years later, um, I was approached. I did not approach them. I have, um, I was approached by a publisher and I have a full book coming out. I've just published a book chapter on this. Um, in colleges at the crossroads, the book chapter was in, but my book is called Boys, Balls and Books, mm -hmm. Untangling the Provocative Relationship Between Academics and Collegiate Sports. I'm and it be should be out next that. fall. Same. Excellent. Yeah. You're going to be very excited to read that. That's that's great. And I'm glad you're continuing to work in this field because that is, that is so important. So thank you so much, Sally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank Jamie Willard for providing background music. You can find more of his music on YouTube. We'd also like to thank Adam Schultz for the Pineal Express logo. If you like Pineal Express, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash pinealexpress and consider pledging your support in exchange for patron rewards, including extra show episodes and content. If you can't pledge your support, please consider giving us a positive rating and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to our patrons at the Conscious Conductor level of support. Patrons like you, Tara Lee, Harris Hajiabdij, and Megan Ryan, help to keep Pineal Express running.